Thank you for coming out and braving the weather. I'm Ruba Katrieb, the curator here at Sculpture Center, and I'm very pleased to introduce Alex Kitnick, who will be speaking tonight on hand sculptures. Alex is a Los Angeles-based uh, teacher and writer. Um, he has his PhD from Princeton University, um, writes for a number of publications, and is speaking on the occasion of the this exhibition on view, a uh, disagreeable object. And actually, you're looking at the disagreeable object right now by Alberto Giacometti, which um, in part inspired this, this exhibition. So, um, Alex, we'll start and go into the hand sculpture more in depth. Um, thank you. talk in relation to her exhibition here in New York, A Disagreeable Object. Uh, it's, an ex whoa. it's an exhibition that takes Giacometti's big, or at least good-sized sculpture of 1931 as its starting point, a detached object, a part object, a phallus both repulsive and desiring, a rod with extra bumps and warts and spikes around its end and lets it point the way forward to the various legacies of surrealist sculpture that we encounter in contemporary artwork today. We're not necessarily forward. The thing can point in a myriad of directions. When I see it, it makes me imagine a game that might be called spin the disagreeable object. And when it stops and chooses you and points at you, it's both scary and exciting. And tonight, I think it's pointing at me. My own talk then will intersect with the exhibition of points, but it also comes at some of its main points from another direction, another angle, another vector. It points with another kind of object, the one we might see that is equally agreeable and disagreeable in terms. And just so no one starts to panic, this talk is not actually going to be two hours. And I've also tried to edit out all expressions such as on the one hand and on the other hand. Uh, it's very thematic, schematic, sketchy, fragmented, and I may repeat myself at times. So I've been interested in this idea of hand sculpture for a little while, have had it in the back of my mind, and this talk is in many ways a way of trying to figure out this interest, of catching up with it, but also at the risk of getting lost in it. It's an evocative term, hand sculpture, one that has an historical concrete definition as an assignment in the Bauhaus curriculum, but at the same time it is also suggestive and open-ended, more than a proper noun, and it can be flexed in a number of different ways. It could mean a sculpture of a hand or a sculpture made by hand, but for me, importantly, tonight, it is a sculpture for the hand. That's what I want to focus on. Sculptures that imagine their lives with the body. Sculptures that need bodies to, sculptures that need bodies, and sculptures giving themselves over to hands. Oh my God, yeah. It's double-sided, sorry. Uh, sculptures that need bodies to be completed, that rolled off the pedestal and unhinged from the base and made their way toward the body towards us. Standing in the middle of the 20th century, somehow in the midst and in the wake of abstract expressionism at once, Ad Reinhardt quipped that sculpture is what you bump into when you're trying to back up to look at a painting. For him, sculpture was life-size, as big as the body, if not bigger, a marker, if not a monument. And here I'm showing you uh, Barnett Newman's famous broken obelisk, which was the, uh, 
hopefully people in the back can see. This was the sculpture that was in the atrium at MoMA when uh, it first, when it reopened. And I thought it was particularly funny because no one's looking at the sculpture in the photograph. Um, so when Reinhardt made that comment, he was looking at official sculpture, institutional sculpture, but I think in certain ways he missed where sculpture had gone, the turn it had taken, the moment where it had become radical, what it had become. Despite the shiny, blown up balloon dogs we see perched in Versailles and other places today, I think that maybe one of the innovations of sculpture in the 20th century was to get small. To revise Reinhardt, one might say that sculpture is what you hold in your hand, or what you might have held in your hand at certain points during the 20th century if you wanted to feel the future. Kurt Schwitters described a number of the wonderful variegated works he made in the, light, in the late 1930s and early 40s as pocket-sized, and it seems significant that he made these works in exile during war, precisely when you might need to put a sculpture in your pocket, when you might need to go mobile. This is not sculpture you bump into, but something you might grab onto for dear life. When you run algorithms over the words hand sculpture, different things come up. This is an image I found when I typed hand sculpture into eBay. And in a way, it says everything I want to say tonight. The cupped, begging, almost prayer-like hands, literally a hand sculpture, holding an iPhone and little trinkets, which appear too as sculptures for the hand. Hand sculptures for a hand sculpture, a kind of sculpture that is grab and go, that is right there for you at the door, a sculpture that is a design object and vice versa, the nearness of art to design. There is a kind of loop here, hands turning into sculptures and sculptures giving themselves over to hands, a back and forth between subject and object. This flux is a new thing though. For a long time, sculpture was seen as a perfected form capturing something eternal, whether about the body or the human spirit, and often those two were the same thing. This is just a Greek sculpture I'm showing you. And I, I thought it was funny that he's holding a little hand sculpture, too. Uh, in his famous essay on the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, Walter Benjamin affirmed this idea so that he could make a point about film, to show how film and sculpture were different. Film is the artwork most capable of improvement, he wrote, and this capability is linked to its renunciation of eternal value. This is corroborated by the fact that for the Greeks, whose art depended on the production of eternal values, the pinnacle of the arts was the form least capable of improvement, namely sculpture, whose products are literally all of a piece. That was all Walter Benjamin. In a very literal way, because sculpture is all of a piece, hewn out traditionally out of a block of marble, it's hard to improve on, hard to add to. And then Benjamin concludes with a remark that struck me, which seems to perhaps foreshadow Reinhardt's in a way. In the age of the assembled artwork Benjamin, Benjamin wrote, which is to say the age of modernity, the age of mechanical reproduction, the decline of sculpture is inevitable. In many ways, Benjamin was right on the mark. Sculpture at that moment and sculpture after did its best to get rid of this eternal logic. It tried to update it and it tried to be modern. Dadaists and surrealists from whom Benjamin took inspiration assembled and cobbled various objects together, piling things on top of one another and so would members of the neo-avant-garde in the 1950s and 60s, such as Robert Rauschenberg and others. Uh, and I'm showing you on the left a famous sculpture by George Gross and John Hartfield, which kind of well, intentionally was taking aim at this kind of um, archaic Greek sculpture and uh, Rauschenberg's great monogram on the right. Um, what I want to focus on here, though, what intrigues me in Benjamin is this idea of improvement. The idea that sculpture can't be improved upon since it, is, since it strives for eternal values. 
if we accept or take seriously what Dadaists and Surrealists were trying to do, and which is to say, to, to say that they were actually really trying to make anti-art, to say that they were going against um, these time-tested virtues, um, of trying to make it timely, of trying to make it uneternal, we might ask what it might mean to imagine how sculpture, how art or sculpture might be all of a piece, how it might be eternal in modernity, but with the idea that this eternal modern sculpture hadn't been arrived at yet, that it could still be, that it had to be improved. So I'm having a hard time finding uh, the proper words there, but what I'm trying to say in a way is that modernity on the one hand, or certain modern artists, you know, kind of took an anti-art position and were uh, doing things antithetical to the traditions of sculpture. So they cobbled things together, they did assemble. What I'm trying to say is, what if we thought, okay, we're trying to make um, a kind of eternal, in quotes, modern sculpture, a uh, modern sculpture that is all of a piece. How can we follow this kind of traditional logic of sculpture and push it forward? So if the body had been perfectly and ideally expressed by the Greeks, what I want to suggest is the space that lied or laid around it had not. And this is where my idea of hand sculpture comes in. It's not really my idea, but this is how I'm putting it together. Or what we might think of more broadly as negative space sculpture. This was still a kind of striving after the eternal, but what's interesting, what interests me, is how this strive for the eternal necessitated and in fact ended up creating a new subject. So the first site of research for this, what I'll call, at least now, negative space sculpture, the sculpture around the body, uh, what we might also call ergonomic sculpture, was the Bauhaus in Germany and later the new Bauhaus in Chicago. Um, and here, this is uh, just a page spread from Laszlo Moholy Naj's The New Vision. And on the left is kind of a spread of these designs. And on the right, uh, figure, it says, figure 78, Edna, Edna Morse, New Bauhaus, first semester, 1937, hand sculpture in wood. Oh, at the Bauhaus, and later at the new Bauhaus, all students had to make hand sculptures. It was something they had to pass through to move on with their studies. The hand was the place to begin. It was an exercise that emphasized questions about tactility above visual questions. An art more for the hand than the eye. It was art with its eye on use value, though, a way for art to put itself, perhaps one day in the service of design. The students and teachers were still thinking abstractly, abstractly though, at the level of prototypes. Hand sculptures were to be ventures and prompts for future industry. Before the students graduated to hand sculptures, though, they had to create tactile charts, unlettered, unconnected keyboards, keyboards that played the player, so they could figure out how different materials trigger different sensations. The school, and this is, uh, I'm showing you one on the top there, um, this kind of tactile chart. And it's interesting, I think, that this was a, a project before the hand sculpture. So this is kind of, uh, I guess, le literally a learning curve, we could think of it as. And then uh, this image below of uh, blind people using these things. And it says, figure 12, the blind test tactile charts of the new Bauhaus students. The blind people enjoyed the testing of the tactile charts very much. This was perhaps the first time that they had experienced with their fingers something like a picture. One stated an appreciation of the charts, they are made for comfort. My goodness. Uh, they are made for comfort. Uh, and I think, what strikes me now, actually, reading that little caption, um, this kind of weird uh, connection back and forth between touching a picture and uh, 
that to me seems uh, very contemporary and is uh, perhaps one of my interests in this material. Um, so the school brought in blind people, authentic touchers, to tell the students how things felt. The goal was to get after a deep knowledge of the hand to see how materials affected the body. In the new vision, first published in 1938, Laszlo Moholy-Naj wrote, when the student finishes his tactile chart in which he discriminates with his fingertips the different qualities of touch sensations, he has to make a hand sculpture. Through this, he registers the functions of the hands, that is to catch, to press, to twist, to feel thickness, to weight, to go through holes, etc. And reading that, um, it makes me think now of uh, Richard Serra's famous list, uh, his verb list of things to do to sculptural material. Um, but it's, it's a kind of training of the hand, a kind of investigation of the hand. Hand sculptures were conceived as a kind of training ground for the hand and even for the fingertips, teaching them to do new things, how to get a better grip. To make a sculpture in the Bauhaus then was less to learn about traditional sculptural problems and more to learn about the hands that might hold them or interact with them. The funny thing, though, is that aside from their scale, these hand sculptures had much in common with the dominant forms of modern art. And here I'm showing you um, a work by Barbara Hepworth on the left and uh, Henry Moore on the right. And you can just see um, this kind of superficial, at least, uh, but maybe more than that, uh, connection with these kind of Bauhaus hand sculptures. Um, so, and this is Moholy Naj now. Hand sculptures are nearest to the timeless forms of any age because they express the purest functions of the hands, Moholy wrote. So the hand for him, again, is this kind of static uh, thing, pure, timeless. And then he kind of jumps um, and he says they often evidence a likeness to the free shape sculpture of Hans Arp, Henry Moore, and Barbara Hepworth. So this was not kind of lost on them, which I think is um, an interesting point. But there was a kind of uh, bringing down or making small, a kind of reimagining of this kind of sculpture. So to go back to the Benjamin, if we can still keep that in mind, if Benjamin imagines sculpture as eternal in its pursuit of perfection, hand sculpture, as Moholy Naj was saying, also went after the timeless, though uh, it's trying to kind of mimic nature more. And again, to reiterate, where the former tried to represent the body, here was something for the body, a hand that would ostensibly never change. But as these objects learned more and more about the hand and gave way to new objects, the timeless quality of the hand was deferred or endlessly updated. So, one second. To swing roughly back to our surrealist starting point for a moment, I just want to note how different this kind of Bauhaus experiment was from what the surrealists were doing with the object at the same time. It's almost as if they felt what the Bauhaus was up to and tried to counteract it, push back on it, hotwire it, which I think is what Merit Oppenheim was doing in her infamous for teacup of 1936. The idea here was not to arrive at some eternal function of the hand, but to take its deep associations and other deep associations and overlay them on, main, on mundane objects, to make them too weird, to put fur up to your lips when you go for a sip of tea. In a 1936 text titled Crisis of the Object, André Breton wrote that surrealist objects are calculated primarily to raise the interdict resulting from the stultifying proliferation of those objects which impinge on our senses every day and attempt to persuade us that anything that might exist independently of these objects might be illusory. For me, that's a totally amazing uh, passage and 
seems like it kind of might describe a world uh, that we live in today. It seems very prescient to me. And in fact, I'll take the liberty of reading it one more time. So Breton wrote that surrealist objects are calculated primarily to raise the interdict resulting from the stultifying proliferation of those objects which impinge on our senses every day and attempt to persuade us that anything that might exist independently of these objects might be illusory. So here is a kind of, he's describing a world in which objects make demands on us uh, that in fact might even desire us and objects insisting that they are in a whole world with nothing outside of them. It seems clear then that surrealist objects imagine themselves as little moments or stutters of resistance against a new but already overwhelming culture of design. Excuse me. One way of de-objectifying or resisting these objects was to hybridize them with other things, clash them with other worlds. Importantly though, and I think this is a key difference, these were artistic experiments tiny pockets of registered difference. Surrealists never sought access to production like the Bauhaus did, and it's hard to imagine the world we'd be living in now if they had. So the rise of this, what we might call design culture, which is also, of course, paired with this kind of uh, culture of mechanical reproduction, as we know, uh, it took place at the expense of the producing hand, at the expense of hand crafts, at the expense of manual production. And in this vacuum that was created, the consumer rushed in to take its place, ushering in something like productive consumption, a consumption that would make the world go. As manual fabrication moved away from artistic and industrial production over the course of the 20th century, however, the hand lived on in strange and different ways, hinted at and seen from askance. We see this already in Duchamp's ready-mades. It is striking how many of them have handy or manual associations, a bottle rack or a shovel, if only to deny it, to hold the hand at bay, to make it unuseful, to make us contemplate what we can't have access to. And of course, um, Duchamp said, one of the great tenets of his work, uh, it was based on choice. And so I like to think of this as a kind of new choosing hand. Have people been able to hear me? Okay. Should I just start from the top? <laughs> All right. uh, so this, we, we have this kind of shift from the manual hand to the consuming hand, uh, or productive hand to the consuming hand, which I think we're all somewhat familiar with. Um, today though, and this is maybe the kind of crux of what I want to say, I, I think there's been a kind of re-emergence, uh, a new incarnation of the hand. And it's a hand presaged and initially produced uh, in the Bauhaus hand sculptures that we looked at earlier and one that has nothing to do with ideas of mastery or authorship that are often associated with the hand, and which was another kind of reason it was banished over the course of the century. About a year ago, uh, I curated an exhibition called Massage, a title distilled from Marshall McLuhan's 1967 book, The Medium is the Massage, an Inventory of Effects. McLuhan's massage was about how the world rubbed us, how a panoply of media come down on us hard, bump us around, alternately shock us, clamor for our attention, and send us into a trance. But if McLuhan was talking about massage figuratively and imagined it as something that might rub us together, I felt that it was starting to get literal. The kind of cosmic light shows that McLuhan looked at in his book that he saw as evidence of a new kind of connectedness, I thought were giving way to hot spots 
and the promise of an electrified global village was giving way to the pressures of uh, what, I, what I called isolation with a lowercase i and a capital S. I started noticing, I'm not the only person who noticed this, but I did, uh, that in storefronts all over town and in other towns, massage parlors were popping up. There was a kind of touch economy emerging, and it struck me that this actual massage was a kind of endpoint to the mediation that McLuhan was talking about, and not its antidote. So in a way it was like the final frontier, the final experience. Not something necessarily to make us feel better about all this. But of course, this was not the only kind of touch happening. There were also new phones with touch pads that, that I have. And there was a kind of loop of handwork being done that connected pad to shoulder and created perhaps a shoulder pad. Uh, clearly, a number of artists today are thinking about this new kind of touch which fuses the subject and object together in a new prosthesis. And we see this uh, in the upper right-hand corner in the work of an artist named Josh Klein. And he did these kind of small, waxy sculptures um, of different people that actually have proper names. So this person works in retouching and is holding a mouse. Uh, he's, done another one of like a fashion PR person holding a kind of Blackberry thing. Um, and so that's one kind of thing happening. And then there's maybe also a turn to what we might call like a kind of inassimilable object. Um, objects that comically dysfunction, as in this addition to work behind my shoulder, uh, which conjoins a uh, vacuum top uh, and a pepper grinder by Luci Stahl and Wolfgang Breuer. And so there's this kind of sucking and coming out and kind of, it's kind of dumb, but kind of silly. And I'm sure there's, there's a lot of things, uh, maybe in this exhibition as well, which would kind of fall into that category. Um, and in the work of certain artists, and we see this pointed at in Klein's work, the hand itself has re-emerged as subject matter, um, a kind of hand sculpture in the most literal way. Um, not a hand that has been improved upon or that in any way looks eternal, but one that has been radically changed is perhaps the victim of improvement, a hand that has assimilated and incorporated into itself the stuff it is surrounded by, crude refuse, in the case of Michaela Eichwald, which is the work on the left that has a plunger stuck up it, which is violated and filled with pill casings, a kind of psycho hand or haunted hand. And in the work of Andre Koschmieder on the right, uh, which uh, Sam Pulitzer has written about uh, in what I think is an incisive fashion, uh, the hand has taken on a ghostly presence. It's become skeletal. Something as virtual as the different worlds it controls and clicks with its fingertips. A new combination between gesture and industry, it maps a weird liminal space somewhere between 2D and 3D, a kind of wrinkle and surface. It's the most dramatic ending ever for a talk. It's worth pointing out that both Eichwald and Koschmieder use resin, which has something of the logic of the interface to it, a way of mediating between distinct realms, the real and the virtual, the technological and the hand or the handmade. It's like the hand and interface have fused or spasmed, the former getting pumped up with the latter, like it's the only way to survive the future or a warning perhaps from the future. What we see in these works is how sculptures for the hand, and here I'm talking about the Bauhaus inventions and things that came after it, though ostensibly made for its formerly timeless features, couldn't help but reconfigure it, couldn't help but reconfigure it, turning it 
into the everyday ticky, ADD, fidgety hand that I have today, though I really try to play it down. Up against this, I am reminded of the image I found cruising eBay in the middle of the night, desperately extending its hands, begging or praying for a bit of salvation, which turns out to be an already outdated iPhone. Yeesh. Thank you. I think what I'm trying to map out is kind of how the contemporary object culture is kind of coming more from um, this Bauhaus precedent and that, you know, the surrealist object is kind of a counter, you know, to that. Or, and then looking at some of these contemporary works and I think they have something in common with this kind of surrealist object, but it, they seem more to me like the kind of uh, victims of desire, or kind of relics of desire. Um, it's kind of like, the, you know, there's a real quality of kind of like aftermath to these types of works. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think I'm addressing you completely, but that's crudely, I guess, what I was trying to get at. But desire definitely would be a, a key word. Yeah, and there's a famous picture that I uh, could have showed that I wanted to leave it more open, of a, uh, but it does give you a good sense of the scale um, in which a woman is kind of cradling this object, almost if it's a kind of um, you know, child figure. So, and I, I think, you know, that's often what's said about this object is that it's something maybe you want to get close to and it's kind of threatening um, at the same time. There's a kind of duality to it, and uh, um, I, I think that's the case when you, when you see it. Maybe it's, is it more fun to speak amongst ourselves? Yeah, it seems like the range is stopped in time. <laughs> Just stopped in time to go home.